Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today is going to be part 6 of my Union uh, Let's Play for the game Ultimate General Gettysburg. Uh, in this battle, we're taking a look at a hypothetical Confederate attack on the Union left flank on July 3rd. Uh, the battle's gone much better than historically uh, it had up to this point. Uh, this is a scenario which I believe is a hypothetical, you know, what if General Longstreet went around uh, to the Confederate right or the Union left rather than launching Pickett's charge against the front of the Union army? What if they basically tried to flank the army? Now, our previous battles uh, still make this somewhat plausible, and that's because on the first day's fighting, uh, we did end up at the historical ending point along Cemetery Hill, but we had a much better early part of the day and bloodily, bloodily repulsed many Confederate attacks uh, in a much more successful July 1st than historically occurred. July 2nd was again much much more kind to the Union forces. We started the day off by launching an attack against the Confederates rather than waiting for their own attacks to hit up and down the Union line as they did historically. Rather, we launched an attack on the Confederate left and the Union right, uh, taking Benner Hill and driving our line out north and east of the, um, well, east and a little bit north of uh, the town of Gettysburg. Um, so we had uh, driven back a, a large part of Ewell's flanking attack from July 1st. Uh, then the Confederates launched an attack against Cemetery Hill proper, our position on Benner Hill with General Stewart's cavalry trying to flank us and, and overrun our line, as well as our center on Cemetery Ridge. Uh, we held all of our positions, drove the Confederates back, and won a major victory holding our position. That does lead a, a good hypothetical attack into the Union left because the Confederates essentially have launched unsuccessful attacks against our right and our center. So for them to launch an attack against our left flank is very similar to what happened at Gettysburg, except in real life at Gettysburg, Lee launched attacks on the, the Union right and left and failed and went for the center because that's the only area he hadn't tried. Now, the only area he hasn't tried is the Union left, which is by far the strongest defensive position, excluding Culp's Hill, I believe, at least in terms of terrain. Um, so here's the scenario. Sir, the left flank is faltering under Confederate attack. We must form a strong defensive. Or, wow, I can't even read. We must form a strong defense before the Confederate launch a major attack. So they're attacking, but they're not? I'm not sure about that. Um, the third, sixth, and... 11th Corps are in the area with your volunteer artillery coming to reinforce us. General Kilpatrick has also dif dispatched a few cavalry brigades. The situation isn't lost yet, and we still have good defensive ground. If we use the reinforcements to supplement our defensive, we still stand a good chance. May God be with you, General. So the Confederates have about 13,000 soldiers and 101 guns coming against us, as well as 5,100 reinforcements, probably Confederate cavalry, I would imagine, as the Confederates historically did have some cavalry skirmishes along the left flank of the Union line on July 3rd, despite the main effort being toward the center. The 6th Corps is completely unfought. That's General Sedgwick's Corps. The 3rd Corps under General Sickles is also unfought. Uh, the... 11th Corps, I'm trying to think if they have fought yet. Yes, of course they fought under General Howard. My guess is they're kind of to the north of the line. The uh, 11th Corps is very fought out. They've been fighting since the first day and have been engaged in almost every single battle so far. The uh, 6th Corps is fresh and the 3rd Corps is fresh. The 3rd Corps is rather small. I think it had about 7,000, maybe 8,000 men. 6th Corps is very large. Historically, I think it had around 14 to 15,000 men. And then whatever is left of our 3rd Corps. So you can see we've got 26,000 men with some cavalry inbound. Confederacy is much more bloodied. Uh, they've lost more men in almost every single engagement that we've fought. And they've been beaten in almost every engagement we've fought. They're only going to be able to come at us with a total of 1,800 men when, or 18,000 men when you include reinforcements. That'll put them sh just shy of being outnumbered. But as again in the last battle, uh, the fact is they only have to attack along a few critical points. They don't have to attack the entire line. So some of our numerical advantage is wasted by the fact that we're in a long drawn out line versus the enemy being able to focus their attacks. But enough jibber jabber. Let's go ahead and get into the fight. So as we zoom out here. You can see the Volunteer Reserve Artillery is coming to reinforce us. As we zoom out here, we can see our position along the round top with our refused flanks here. Uh, we've got some good fresh brigades here under the 6th Corps. Again, uh, that's under General John Sedgwick. Uh, as we move north here, we've got the 3rd Corps along some likewise pretty solid terrain with the artillery out front. And then we've got the 11th Corps 
so we've got uh, 11,000 men under the 6th Corps. I think they had more than that historically. About 9,000 men in the 3rd Corps. And then only about 5,800 men in the... Um, in the 6th Corps. So it says Pickett's division is marching in. I believe that's the only fresh Confederate division remaining. You can see here they've got a little bit more artillery than us, I believe. Uh, no, actually 113 guns versus 85 Confederate guns. So we do outnumber them in terms of artillery. Some of that may be our artillery that we saw the uh, uh, or information that they're coming up. I'm wondering if this is going to be kind of the historical large Confederate artillery bombardment, which occurred on July 3rd uh, by General Alexander's artillery with over 200 Confederate artillery pieces firing on the Union forces during the battle of, or the engagement of Pickett's Charge. Um, this could be a similar situation with these Confederate troops up along the Peach Orchard Ridge Line. Um, now, we never lost the Peach Orchard. Uh, in this version of Gettysburg, General Sickles did not move his 9,000 men forward hastily. Uh, as you can see here, that's a very exposed position, so it's probably a good thing that we never moved them forward. Instead, Sickles stayed back on the defensive. So that's good. Uh, it allows his corps to be more useful in the center of our line and uh, should give us a, a better... Um, a better, more rested core than was historically the case because they really got mauled. The reason July 2nd seemed like a pretty close fight is largely because Sickles deployed his men far ahead of anything that the uh, rest of the Union Army was able to support and basically negated a large part of this great defensive ground back here by advancing into the Peach Orchard and the Wheat Field, which were much more open and vulnerable to Confederate flanking attacks being so far in advance of the Union line. It threw a wrench into the Union forces and nearly opened up a gap in the line if his troops had been driven back. Fortunately, there were reserve corps under the 5th and also later in the day the 6th, as well as the 2nd Corps coming up under General Hancock. Sickles was a political general out of New York, I believe it was. The 3rd Corps would historically move on to New York to help suppress the riots which occurred there after the Battle of Gettysburg uh, and did so bloodily. There's probably a fair bit of truth that the uh, Union troops were somewhat pissed off, maybe, about uh, people basically protesting the war after they were fresh from uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. There's this sort of mentality of, uh, of the people being against us and, you know, how dare they do this? They're kind of like traitors and that they're uh, refusing to support the war effort and we just went through this hell and now they're basically stabbing us in the back. Sort of this bitterness of the uh, soldiers having against uh, the people and, and that may have played a part in uh, how bloodily the Union troops put down the riots in New York, basically showing very little mercy to the rioters, very little sympathy, and uh, quite a bit of bloodshed. Sickles was not there in New York, however. Uh, he was a politician, but he was uh, wounded at Gettysburg. His leg was smashed in and amputated, and he was carried from the field, uh, reportedly smoking a cigar uh, as he was uh, carried from the field. You can see General Pickett moving his three brigades down here, uh, rel relatively large brigades. Armistead's brigade of about 1,900, Garnett of 1,400, and Kemper of some 1,700 men. All right. So, it's going to be interesting. I wouldn't be surprised if the Confederates try and flank a uh, big round top in this case. It's not a uh, little round top, it's just the big round top. Little round top is a more central position here. Uh, the rebels are going to have to advance through the Devil's Den to get to us. General Longstreet over here, it's going to be his core that's largely involved in this attack. And they're of the freshest uh, variety of the Confederate troops. Um, although it does look, I don't think Kershaw was part of Longstreet's core. I could be wrong. I can't remember who all was in which core. Law, Anderson. Anderson's division was definitely a part of Hill's corps. So if this is An General Anderson's division, yes it is. Uh, but if it's his brigade, there, there were multiple Andersons. So I, I'm not sure if this goes with uh, the main force being part of the first corps or whether this is like the historical attack where uh, hills divisions were used uh, with Pickett. I believe it's Barksdale was part of uh, Longstreet's corps so I believe this is mainly the first corps which would make sense because they were positioned on the confederate right flank so as the uh, confederates would advance against the union flank if they pulled troops from the center they would basically have a huge gap in the middle of their line so rather it looks like they're pulling troops from their flank which is you know makes sense if you're going to move forward on on your right against the union left then move forward with the troops already there don't vacate other parts of the line. 
So you can see here we've got about a 9,000 man advantage in terms of manpower. It uh, looks like Kemper, Armistead, and Garnet are forming into uh, battle line formation, so it'll be interesting to see if they come forward. If we take the Peach Orchard, I wouldn't be surprised if uh, we route the Confederate Army altogether. We may have already routed it, uh, to be honest. We've won every single battle with one exception. There was one draw earlier in this uh, in this battle, uh, so or one engagement that ended in a draw earlier. So. If we are victorious, that would be pretty awesome. Um, but I think if we take the Peach Orchard, you could probably make the argument uh, that um, the Confederates uh, might have had the Northern Army of Northern Virginia routed. It says Sickles has lost 7% of his forces. I'm going to guess that's mainly artillery, because so far we're really just seeing an artillery duel uh, between, these, uh, between these guys here. Okay... Howard's lost about 30% of his corps so far in this battle. And, uh, oh, Sickles might have had a few of his units engaged in one of the earlier battles. That's probably it. I'm really tempted to advance my regular infantry, but that's a lot of artillery to advance against. I've got a bad feeling that at close range that canister fire would play, play havoc on me. I think I've talked about it before, but artillery was becoming increasingly deadly around the, the age of the Civil War. There was actually a, a cannon that the Confederates imported in incredibly small numbers called the Whitworth Cannon, uh, which had a breech loading mechanism. So all of these cannons here that you see in this battle are muzzle loaders, which basically means you every time you shoot, you got to take a little round ball. Well, first you got to swab out the barrel to make sure there's no sparks left over from the previous shot. Then you've got to go ahead and take a, a round ball or canister of some kind and put it in... Um, oh, goodness, I'm getting things backwards. So you swab out the ashes. Then you have to put in the gunpowder. Then after that, you have to put in the cannonball or the shrapnel or whatever you're shooting. And then you can go ahead and shoot. And it all has to go in the front of the cannon. Well, what the Whitworth rifle introduced was the concept of a breech-loading, uh, self-contained artillery piece. So instead of doing that all in the front, what you could do is you could actually load artillery from the back of the cannon. And it was a much quicker loading gun. It was much more accurate. It had something like an eight hexagonal uh, pattern rifling, which was completely unique and novel at the time uh, to a weaponry, which gave it much longer range, much more accurate range, and allowed it to fire much quicker. Now, we're not talking French 75s spitting out 20 rounds a minute or anything like that. But it did signal kind of the start of steel artillery, sort of changing the nature of warfare, if you will, or changing the nature of uh, the way artillery operated on the battlefield. And uh, that was something that uh, was going to fundamentally change the way that a lot, of, uh, a lot of battles were fought. You would see a big difference in the way that the battles were fought during the uh, Franco-Prussian War just six years later. Uh, in large part, the German advantage stems from their advantage in artillery. A lot of the French military in the 1870s was still using muzzle-loading cannons. The Germans were using breech-loading cannons for the most part. Uh, all sides were using much more rapid-fire weapons, similar to kind of like the Sharps repeating rifles, uh, or not repeating, but breech-loading rifles. And uh, you really saw a change in the nature of warfare, and uh, warfare becoming much more gruesome. Um, hard to believe, right? I mean, if you're talking about the Civil War, uh, probably one of the most gruesome wars ever. But in terms of being an infantryman in the open field, uh, the changes to artillery were dramatic. Uh, in the Civil War, artillery, as far as infantry concerned, was one of the biggest killers on the battlefield, but it wasn't a huge threat at range. Unless your unit exposed its side where the artillery could fire down your line and basically not miss, as happened at the Battle of Second Manassas to the Union forces there, Unless you, you got caught in a bad position, the main threat from artillery was close-range canister fire. Not long-range fire, as would become the case uh, just a few late years later, but short-range canister fire. Basically, a canister full of BBs that would shoot, I mean, you could call them BBs, lead balls, that would shoot out like a shotgun and just mow people down uh, with hundreds of little balls packed into a tiny little canister over a very small uh, section of the battlefield, it made uh, the it made the life of an infantryman attacking artillery hell and very difficult. And if you got extremely close into the artillery, well, then you would launch double canister at them, which would basically be two of these canisters of hundreds of little balls against the uh, 
um, infantry, the advancing infantry. So those types of attacks, especially at Pickett's Charge, would absolutely devastate infantry. But it wasn't normally the biggest killer at longer ranges. It could certainly disrupt an attack. And when artillery had big, wide open planes to play with, like during uh, Pickett's Charge or during Fredericksburg, artillery would indeed devastate infantry. But, again, it wasn't the deciding factor on the battlefield, with the exception of when troops were advancing over the open, and most of those casualties would still come at close range. Um, whereas, if you look toward the 1870 conflict between Prussia and France, that really had started to change. And you had fortress artillery against infantry, and it was just, it was, it was not a good place to be if you were an infantry soldier going up against cannons. Not what you wanted to do uh, for your your life. Now it looks like the Confederates are forming up and launching an attack here. We've got three brigades coming up. Looks like Pickett's division uh, and more are forming up. They're starting to move their artillery forward. I moved my right flank forward uh, to try and engage and maybe weaken some of their artillery. Ames Brigade is getting shot to pieces already. Uh, by this artillery at pretty close range. So again, these are troops advancing over the open into open ground. Uh, the exact thing I said that artillery would be incredibly effective against is what I'm doing here. My troops' morale is plummeting. I'm just hoping to damage some of their guns and maybe reduce the uh, the effect of their, their cannons here. But Ames is just getting shattered. Just look at that. He lost almost 100 men in just a split second. And that's a small brigade. So, uh, yeah, now Krasinski, or whatever his name is, is going to be next, without a doubt. Um, but again, we, we inflicted some losses on that artillery, so as long as the enemy doesn't try and go around our flank, we should be okay. So here are the enemies coming forward. Uh, you can see them massing against us. I don't think they're going to try and go around our flank, so I'm going to pull Neil's brigade here from our flank and act it as a, move it in as a reserve. Um... Most of our artillery's out front. Our line here is somewhat thin in the center, so they could try and break the line right here, but we've got a lot of artillery that should hopefully be able to do the same thing with the Confederates uh, that they just did to Ames Brigade out in the open. The boys are pretty much routed and done. I don't know if it's worth charging. I don't know if you can charge artillery, or do you, can you only charge infantry? I'm not sure. I just ordered Krasinski to charge. You can see the Confederates bringing up this rather large brigade under se semis, sems, uh, to try and, yeah, Krasinski just got torn to pieces. And again, at this range, you can see I'm not inflicting much in the way of casualties on the enemy. They're moving through the Devil's Den up against the little round top. My troops have very strong defensive positions, uh, so that should make things difficult. My artillery is pulling back slowly. Um, I'm going to go ahead and tell these guys to hold. Going to tell Wheaton to hold as well. Hopefully these guys can kind of form into the line and fire canister at point-blank range into the enemy. Uh, although the terrain that they're advancing across, again, is not the best for artillery. They're not in the open, per se. Neil should be able to fire against Kemper. Those are some big Confederate brigades that are moving against us. So this could, be, this could pose a challenge here. Again, because I have to defend this long, drawn-out line, it makes my position more vulnerable than it otherwise would be. Looks like Seams has been driven back. So, there's that. Casualties appear to be pretty even so far. I would think given the phenomenal defensive ground that we have, though, things are going to start tilting in my favor in terms of casualties anyway. But again, this is a huge enemy division that's coming right at us through a difficult terrain, but definitely posing a serious threat to our position here. They are driving our artillery back. Uh, we're not losing many guns, so it looks like the AI for the artillery in this game does a pretty good job of pulling back without um, too much in the way of uh, stupid losses. See Adams here, his, his, our, his troops are reloading their guns, they're starting to lose some men there, and they're pulling back now. So, but now in, in trying to push back the enemy infantry, Law has exposed his flank and just took some pretty heavy losses there. Adams' battalion or battery just got shattered though, that's one battery that clearly took a beating. I'm going to tell him, I'm going to tell Ward and Graham both to hold, though. Hopefully they can 
drive back Kershaw like they just did Law. They're also exposing their flank to pretty close range artillery fire and canister fire at that. So, you know, they drove back a couple artillery regiments, but that exposed the side of one of their units to artillery, which just fired canister into them. And you can see there Kershaw losing very heavily. Okay. So Kemp Kershaw's brigade's been driven back. Law has been broken. Barksdale's brigade is, is being taught a lesson here. So again, the Confederates advancing up in the north over pretty open terrain despite some pretty solid numbers in terms of manpower just didn't do much. Uh, the fight is, is definitely drawing out here down by Big Round Top where there's a lot more terrain and cover to hide behind so the casualty rates are much lower per second anyway. Still, our guys are holding up okay. Gonna get uh, Sedgwick down here, though, so we can provide a morale boost to our troops to make sure they don't break. Now, with these Confederate troops retreating in this direction, that poses a question, because if they swing around my flank, I have exposed my flank uh, to the enemy. So, uh, something I've got to be mindful. I do have Russell kind of in reserve. I've got Eustace's brigade in reserve as well. Again, I would like to advance and try and take the Peach Orchard, but I think the enemy just has too many artillery pieces there. I don't want to just advance my men forward to get slaughtered. This unit looks like it's almost off the map. I don't know if they fight if they're off the map. So let's run this way. Oh no, they fight. That's dumb. So again, trying to trying to negate some of those batteries up north. If I can drive, with this brigade of mine, if I can drive these batteries off, then I can make a concerted effort to drive against the Peach Orchard. I probably could now. Um, you know what? Why wait? Yeah, let's go ahead and do that. I don't know if this is the smartest thing. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. I don't really have that many guys over here. I'm pretty spread out. Confederates have a strong line, and with all that infantry that they're bringing in to form up along the Peach Orchard line, I think we're going to be better just to settle for a minor victory, most likely a minor victory. It's only worth 3,000 points. Uh, our objectives are worth almost, uh, almost 30,000, 27,000 points there between the objectives we have. Bring Phillips up so we've got some more artillery. Bring Thomas up so we've got more artillery. We've got some artillery in the rear here. We may be approaching the end of the battle. The enemy really hasn't seriously threatened any of our objectives. The closest they've gotten to anything is Big Round Top here on the south. I think this will probably end the, the battle as well. The first campaign I did was the Confederacy was a six battle campaign. Looks like this one's probably going to be about six as well. It seems like July 1st has by far the most scenarios, which makes sense. It's the most kind of back and forth meeting type engagement that there is in the... Um, in, in the game or in the in the battle. Uh, July 2nd was much more, you know, Confederates attacking fortified positions. So probably not as easy to model in a video game or maybe not as fun to model. It seemed like, what, maybe there were three or four scenarios the first day. You know, about two the second, one the third. That seems how it kind of plays out. It looks like uh, Kilpatrick has arrived with elements of his cavalry. Now the one thing, because cavalry is so rapid moving, it could be useful against enemy batteries, but it seems like the AI is just forming up a defensive line along its artillery pieces, which I'm not going to push back. I only have an advantage of about 11,000 soldiers, which is big, but I've got to get rid of these guys on my left flank. Then I can swing my entire line around their flank and crush them and drive their artillery back. If this was a battle... Uh, that was concerned with, you know, if there was more scenarios to be played or this was a longer fight that was going to be occurring, then that would be something that I could feasibly do. But at this point in time, I don't think I've got enough time to do that, especially if the battle is going to end when this green line runs out. If the battle goes longer than that, then I may have a chance. But uh, if the battle doesn't, uh, then I'm going to be kind of, kind of stuck here. So Farnsworth has almost a thousand skirmishers. He's also got some cavalry, which now I can threaten the enemy flank and hopefully drive him back. But I really, again, I just don't think I've got the time to, uh... I don't think I've got the time to exploit it, and I don't want to expose my line or risk my position by being overly aggressive. These guys, I think, are staying relatively okay, because it seems like most of the regiment is off the map here. I think the game could do a better job of modeling units that are off map. Okay. 
you can see here, Robinson's or Robertson's brigade is kind of skirmishing with Farnsworth. I'm gonna, I'm gonna at the very least with Farnsworth's brigade threaten the enemy flank. Hopefully get them get them driven back. The use of cavalry mounted and kind of charges and moving back and forth in this very wooded terrain is pretty unrealistic, I will say. You just can't move large bodies of horse through heavily wooded terrain, and I think that's something the game needs to fix. Although, if you do do that, uh, in the cavalry becomes somewhat uh, ineffective at Gettysburg in anything but a mounted or dismounted manner of fighting. With the exception of kind of around the flanks where they historically fought some charges on kind of the western, western field uh, out past any of the main land engagement areas. But uh, we're shooting up Garnett's brigade pretty good. Looks like his men might be retreating. Or at the very least they're charging against our skirmishers. But him and Kemper have lost bad. Kemper was over 2,000 I think to start the battle. They've been, they've been shoot up bad. I wonder, I don't know if these guys have repeating rifles, but they seem to be doing a pretty good job against the Confederates here. Russell's Brigade, you're going to swing around and extend our flank. If Kemper's going to go that way, we need to make sure we're uh, protecting ourselves. Same with Robertson, and if they bring law in, we want to make sure our flank is safe. Looks like we may have a delayed battle here. I'm not sure, but Confederate, yep. Oh, no, battle about to end. 14 minutes, but it's, you know, quick minutes. So we'll see if it gets delayed. They haven't made a serious threat against any of our real defensive positions. Um, they've lost, ooh, what, maybe about 3,000 men. So this is one of the least bloody fights we've fought so far, um, at least since the first days, maybe first battle. That might have been an exception. Confederates are getting a pretty good size of men threatening our flank, though. They've got uh, 12... 1,200 men under Kemper, 1,700 under Law. Kemper, I don't trust to stand up against a regiment that's pretty fresh. His troops have been shattered. Law is, is much stronger and more of a threat. Robertson's less of a threat. But we've got Russell's very fresh brigade coming in here on the flank and very good defensive terrain, as well as enough cavalry and skirmishers to kind of blunt any serious effort. You can see here it says the battle was delayed, so the battle is not ending yet. here I got Russell here across though Farnsworth has taken some casualties nothing too bad again the wooded terrain really limits how many casualties you lose but again it says the battle's about to end again so I guess we'll see here I don't know if it's just gonna keep delaying or if it's gonna actually end we'll see again I, I think taking the peach orchard might have been possible if I launched that attack right away a full-blown attack right away before Pickett could get into position but uh, I just, I would have had to totally vacate all my VP points. And the Confederates are much stronger on the north and on the south end of the line. Their center was weak, but uh, I don't think I had enough men really to exploit that. Battle delayed again, so it's still not ending. You can see that red line is making progression. I didn't really have a topic to talk about uh, in this video. Um, other than this kind of what I've been talking about. I think for this series of, of the game, for the Ultimate General game, I've enjoyed it a lot, obviously. I've played it a lot. This is, uh, I think, what, the 14th video I've made for it. The six-part six Confederate Let's Play. This is now a six-part for the Union Let's Play. And then I also did a Q&A uh, video, which was a shorter one. And then I had an Initial Impressions video, uh, which was a little bit of a longer one. Uh, the long, I think the longest one, or close to the longest one that I did. I think this will probably be it for my Ultimate General videos and I say that with a caveat it's going to be it for the single player uh, they're definitely going to be adding multiplayer that's everything that's been said is they're going to be adding multiplayer and I definitely want to do some videos of multiplayer me playing some humans I don't know how good I am I think I'm probably too cautious to be great at multiplayer uh, but I am going to give it a shot I'm going to play some videos against a, uh, a youtuber holy cow look at sims brigade just getting hit by crossfire like crazy there from all those batteries um, but uh, I think I'm going to do some videos with Agrippa Maxinius. He's a YouTuber who does similar style games. He's done some Ultimate General stuff. I think I'm going to do some videos with him. Uh, might also do some with Belugan Campaign. If you're familiar with the Command series, you probably uh, know who he is. And um, 
I think that'd be uh, a fun, fun thing to do with some videos with him, uh, as well as with Agrippa Maxinius. Maybe I'll do some with, you know, someone else. I don't know. If you've, if you've got a channel, if you're interested in doing it, and if you do these types of games, please, you know, give a shout out. I'd be happy to, to maybe play in a game. I don't have any kind of illusions that I'm this great tactician or the best best player at this game ever. I definitely don't think that. That's not my mindset. Um, I haven't done a whole lot of multiplayer for games like this. Uh, the last game I really got into multiplayer was Sid Meier's Gettysburg. Uh, back in the early 2000s is when I was playing that game uh, multiplayer quite a lot. Uh, it's a similar game to, to this. Uh, you can see a lot of the inspiration from this game comes from Sid Meier's uh, game. It's probably the closest recreation, uh, not of the game of Battle of Gettysburg. I'd say that probably goes to Scourge of War, but again, I'm a little bit biased in that regards because, well, uh, I'm on the Scourge of War team, you know, helping test and stuff. But um, I would say the closest to sort of the same level of combat, the same detail of combat, is probably Sid's game. Uh, Sid was a little bit more detail in some sense. Artillery had, for example, rifled and smoothbore guns, which I don't think this game has as far as I can tell. Um, you also had some rifled units, uh, just a couple of specialty units. And uh, you, you had units at a regimental level. So instead of, these are all brigades, which consists of, you know, three, four, five regiments of infantry, uh, and you only command a brigade level, whereas in Sid's game, uh, you actually commanded at the regimental level, which is the fundamental building block of Civil War armies, so it was a little bit more realistic in that sense, uh, but the general look and feel and kind of the way the game plays is very similar to Sid Meier's Gettysburg. I would love for Sid to uh, re, you know, re-release for modern gaming systems, Gettysburg. That I think that'd be a great thing to do. It was a critical success as pretty much everything that Sid Meier does, um, and for a long time it was the gold standard. But it had multiplayer, and uh, that's what I was really talking about, is the game had multiplayer uh, that was played out in, um, what, what was the gaming system, GameSpot, and, uh, or GameSpy, and I played that a lot. Uh, but not till after the game was no longer all that popular. No, I was playing maybe four or five years after the game came out, 2002, 2003, and there were still several clans going on, um, which I participated in. It was a lot of fun. There was a, a really cool, great, small multiplayer community. I think that this game could do a, a good job of that. Uh, Scourge of War has a, a nice multiplayer community as well. It's a little bit more hardcore, a little bit more realistic, so if you're interested in, in the most authentic Civil War experience in terms of scale, uh, type of combat, tactics, maps, um, I would probably go with Scourge of War. If you're interested in just a really fun, playable game, kind of beer and pretzels like, but also authentic, great sound, good AI, then I, I check this game out, obviously, that you're watching me here play. Uh, so, you know, they're kind of two different, very, they're two very different, but very good games, uh, which do a lot of things right, in my opinion, that's being Scourge of War and Ultimate General. And, uh, you know, I, I can't wait for the multiplayer because I think it could be huge, especially being integrated on Steam. Uh, I do think that there could be a really nice big multiplayer community that uh, spawns up around this and maybe some competitive gaming could come to it. I, I don't know. Uh, it'd be interested to see how much depth that has. I think you might need to add more, more battlefields to do that. Uh, Gettysburg's a nice big map. But I think maybe to add a little bit more variety, maybe a few more neutral maps, uh, more meeting scenarios. I think the scenarios for July 1st would be fine for multiplayer, with the exception of the ones where Yule comes in on the Union flank. Um, some of the early scenarios would be pretty balanced. Uh, but I think some of the problems you're going to run into is these scenarios like this, where you're attacking a very heavily defended line. That's not to say you can't win, because obviously I won as the Confederacy against the AI, but I think when you're playing against a human combatant, uh, having one side attack a defensive position, which is simply the strong, could lead to some balance issues. But I hope I'm wrong. I may be wrong. I'm not sure. Um, I guess we'll find out hopefully shortly. Um, but as you can see here, we won a major victory. The only reason it wasn't an epic or crushing victory, uh, if those are even titles. I know maybe there's a triumphant. There's one above major um, is because we didn't take the peach orchard. You can see there the Confederates lost 3,800 more men. Uh, we lost 2,500. So again, the Confederacy loses more men than we did. We hold all the major objectives. So let's see here if this is the end of uh, Gettysburg or maybe if we've got one more battle. I'm not sure. 
nope, it's it. It's over. So this Let's Play is over, folks. Uh, as you can see here, the outcome of the battle is a triumphant uh, Union victory. Congratulations, General. You've crushed the Rebels and won the Battle of Gettysburg. Your name will be on the lips of every Northerner, and you'll be written into history in gold. Our victor victorious Army of the Potomac can now march to Virginia and finish this war. President Lincoln sends his compliments and is expected to congratulate you in person. You've made us all proud today, sir. So, um, I think you can see here we had 75,750 victory points. The Confederacy, a measly 13,750. We lost 20,000 soldiers. The Confederacy lost 28,201. That's eerily close to the actual casualties of the Battle of Gettysburg. Um, I can look it up here real quick, but I, I want to say it was something like 20,000 to 25,000. Uh, but I'm going to look it up here real quick. Um, just to see. Uh, but that does a really great job of simulating the actual casualties, I guess. I thought it was being over-aggressive and leading to more casualties than happened. Uh, I probably was because there was no devastating final attack by the Confederacy. So, no, things are a little bit more even than I thought. The Union lost 23,055 men. The Confederacy lost 23,231 men. Obviously, there's a bit of uh, variance to that. You could have the statistics be up one way or the other. But uh, the Confederacy lost about 5,000 more, more men than they did historically. That's about another entire division of the Army wiped out. I think it's safe to say the Army of the Potomac probably retreats from this battle in okay order. You know, their attacks all failed. We held our position. Uh, but we didn't really drive them from the field, if you will. I don't know if there's any scenarios where the Union's in a full-flown, you know, counterattack throughout the battle on July 2nd, July 3rd. I'm not quite sure of that. I won pretty much all major victories, so I'm not, maybe not. There are triumphant victories, so maybe if you win those, you can, you can win more devastatingly. But either way, uh, the Confederacy loses over a third of its force. The Union loses only about a fifth of its. And uh, the Confederacy definitely retreated. The Second and Third Corps of the Confederate armies are most likely shattered and uh, hulks of what they were before. The First Corps is still in decent shape. They were never driven from the field. They just uh, failed to launch attacks and succeed, and et cetera, et cetera. So the war is going to go on. We don't win the war, but I think we won the battle about as best as we could. So uh, triumphant victory. And uh, as I said, that's going to end this Let's Play series because obviously we have finished up the game on the Union side. I've got a Let's Play for the Confederate side already. If you're interested in checking that out, check out my uh, links in the description. I hope you enjoyed this, and this is probably just about the end of my, um, of my Let's Play series for this game. Until, uh, at least until you... July 4th, interesting. Uh, at least until you... Until we get multiplayer. Uh, I'm just scrolling through some of the scenarios which you have here. and There's a lot more that I haven't played. So July 1st morning just has the historical one, which I've played. July 1st afternoon, uh, there were a couple I haven't played. It uh, looks like if the Union takes Hare's Ridge, there's another scenario. Uh, or if they make a tactical retreat to Cemetery Heights, that's another scenario which I haven't played, as well as the Oak Ridge variant. Uh, July 1st evening, there's a lot of scenarios here. Holy cow, look at all of these. Everything in gray are things I haven't played. I played through the game fully twice. Uh, once as the Union, once as the Confederates. And you can see here there's a lot more that can go on, including it doesn't look like there's any scenarios yet, but the fact that they've included an afternoon for July 4th clearly says that they're going to be adding more scenarios. So, wow, there are a lot of options. Maybe I'm wrong about multiplayer. Maybe multiplayer uh, is going to have a lot more unique you know, scenarios. I think a lot of the reason maybe I, I didn't feel that way about the game so far is because I've been playing mostly variants of history, and uh, there's a lot more out there that are very different than history. So that's interesting. I think they could also add a lot of depth to the campaign as well if they work those in better. Um, but anyway, so yeah, there's a lot of uh, scenarios there that I'd love to jump in and play, but I don't know how. I think that's one thing that kind of bugs me. Some games do, and a lot of games seem to do it, but I don't want to be locked out of these... Um, I don't want to be locked out of these scenarios because I haven't played them yet in the campaign. Uh, maybe for multiplayer, they'll let you play any scenario you want. I hope they will. But now I'm just rambling. Um, I do appreciate you tuning in. Uh, if I appreciate you supporting the series. My channel has had a huge increase in traffic with this series. I've done very well with this series. Uh, best uh, month last month that I've had ever. Um, and the best week that I had when the first week of this, uh, this series of videos uh, is in over two years. So um, 
I really appreciate the support, guys. Uh, if you want to subscribe, please do. If you want to ha- ask a question, ask me. Uh, I'm I'm historical gamer over at Twitter, so it's just at historical gamer on Twitter. And um, you can also send me an email at historical gamer or sorry historical gamer at gmail.com or throw a like comment description or whatever you want to know here in the uh, in the video here. Uh, so thanks for tuning in for this series. Thanks for tuning in for the uh, Confederate series. Look for some videos in a couple of weeks, I believe, is the time frame for multiplayer. I believe uh, the developer Darth has said that, uh, or the creator of Darth Mods, I forget his first name, has said that they're looking to launch multiplayer in two to three weeks, so probably early August. So please stick around, guys. I've got a lot of other videos coming down the pipe, some more Buzz Aldrin Space Program Manager. I'm going to maybe take a look at World War I Gold. Um, it's a uh, game made by Age of Odd, which simulates the First World War on a strategic level. Uh, there's a, a game of it, I believe it's a remake of the same game called World War, World War I Centennial on, um, on Steam. Different developers, but it's it's built off of the original World War One game, I believe, by Age Odd. I could be wrong, but the two look identical. Um, and I, I, my guess is it's just a more, you know, polished, maybe more modern version. I don't see the point in buying it, considering gold and it look very, very similar, with maybe a few scenario exceptions. But if you don't have it, maybe check out the World War One gold video. You know, you can pick that up still at Matrix, but the Centennial version's out on Steam, and I think it's a little bit cheaper, so it might be worth checking out as well. But that's all the time I have for you today. I've been rambling a little bit too much. Uh, So thank you for tuning in. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching and signing out.